So I'm gonna take a guess and say that you're here because you've seen me or someone like me playing one of those. I mean, I don't know why I'm pointing over there, it's actually over here, but uh, oh well. I wanted to make a little guide to actually show you how to set a project up, because it's not, it's not the most trivial thing in the world to configure a launchpad, as I'm sure you guys know, that's why you're here. So to address a couple of the main questions I always get, I mean, besides where's the one million sub special, uh, something that you guys ask a lot is why does my launchpad not work with Ableton Live Lite, which if you don't know is the version of Ableton that actually comes with the launchpad. And the main reason for that is that there are only two versions versions of Ableton Live that will work with the type of projects that I make and they are Ableton Live Trial and Ableton Live Suite and Suite is the paid version, Trial is obviously free. Live Light and Live Trial are not the same so that will clear up any confusion there. And the other thing is if you're wondering if your launchpad you know is not the same as my launchpad will it work with this project then yes it absolutely will. If it's a standard Novation launchpad any of the main models it'll work absolutely fine. The only other thing I'd suggest doing before before you actually set up a Launchpad project is getting your performance skills up to a really good standard, which you can do with Melodics. Back in the day when I kicked off my Launchpad journey, there was nothing out there to help me learn the skills I needed. Lucky for you guys though, you have Melodics. Melodics is a day-by-day -day training app that takes you through all the resources you need to perfect your performances. It does this in a way that's not overwhelming and just encourages you to get in a few minutes of practice each day to sharpen your abilities. It's also got over 400 hand-picked tutorial sessions to help you tackle all the skills you need, as well as a dedicated tutorial path to help you up right from the start. Head to the link in the description below to find my 20% off discount code to get started with your learning journey. So a lot of my more recent projects use a little device that I've made called MIDI Manager, which lets you basically set an entire launcher project up with just three drop-down menus. But this kind of thing is so advanced that a lot of the older projects don't have it. So I'm going to do two separate sections for this video. I'm going to do a tutorial section saying how to set up a project with MIDI Manager, and another part of this video will be how to set up a project when it doesn't have MIDI Manager, which will be in the chapter markers at the bottom of this video if you need to skip ahead to any of those sections. But if you're going to skip ahead, please follow the initial set up part of this video first because that's the most important section. So if you head over to any sort of project file site, uh, let's say uh, this one, you'll see that there are some projects like this one that have MIDI Manager written underneath them. And obviously these are the ones that include MIDI Manager and all the sort of newer plugins, that sort of thing. But if we take a look at some of the older ones, they just sort of say live, sweet and trial only. They don't say MIDI Manager after it. And obviously these are some of the older projects. So depending on what type of project you download will kind of indicate what parts of this to tutorial are going to be most useful to you. So let's go ahead and download one of these. I'll head over to the Pigstep project for example, click on download project and it'll take you to the Google Drive page where it'll show the zip file and then just press the download button in the top corner if you've not used Google Drive before. It will then say that it can't scan it for viruses and I promise you there's no viruses here so go ahead and download the virus, I mean the project. Then you guys will want to head over to ableton.com slash trial. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind, I can't spell. I did it again. <laughs> So once you're here, you'll want to go ahead and download your version of Ableton, which will either be Universal Mac if you're on uh, the M1 system, it'll be Intel if you're on any of the older Macs, and Windows if you're on Windows. This is the point where if you have Ableton Live Suite, then you can go ahead and download that from your profile rather than getting the trial version. Remember, this will work only with those two. It won't work with Lite, Standard, or Intro are the only other versions that won't work. All right, we got this downloaded. So let's close out of the interweb. Let's head over to the installation file. In case you never installed a, a, an app on your Mac before, you drag it, you put it there, boom, and then you do your password and then done. So before we open Ableton, we want to quickly update the launchpad firmware and also install the USB driver if you're on Windows. So you'll want to find your launchpad in this little page here on downloads.novationmusic.com. If you have a Mark III launchpad, it'll be under here, Mark II launchpad here, and any Mark I launchpad will be in the legacy section. So for a Mark III launchpad, like Launchpad Pro or Launchpad X, for example, on here you'll see it'll say go to Components Web under the Software Links tab. This is the place you need to go to update your firmware, and you'll also find the Windows USB driver up here, which obviously, if you're on a Mac, you don't need this. If you have a Mark II launchpad, like a Mini Pro or Launchpad Mark II, then we'll go on here and there will be a firmware update for your launchpad, depending on what type of launchpad you have, and if you're on Windows, you'll also find the Novation USB drivers here, which you'll want to install based on what version of Windows you have. Finally, for the Mark 1 launchpads, it'll be under the Legacy tab, and you'll find Launchpad Mark 1 up here. 
and this will be for the classic launchpad, original launchpad mini and launchpad S. You won't find a firmware update here, but if you are on Windows, you'll see the Novation USB driver on here as well, which you'll also need to install. Obviously not if you're on a Mac. Cool, so once that's installed, let's go ahead and get that booted up. So if you're on live trial, you'll see this when you start up and stop right here, okay? Before you do anything else, if you press start your free trial, that will start a 90 day timer where you'll be able to save your projects, which to play Launchpad, you don't need to be able to do. You just need to be able to set it up and learn it and perform it, right? If you want to actually make something, then starting your free trial is what you want to do. But if you just want to play for now, then go ahead and click save and export disabled and that will let you use live trial for as long as you want. So go ahead and click that. If you've just opened Ableton by the way and your screen doesn't look the same as mine, then just go ahead and click new project under the file tab and you should get to where I am now. So with Ableton open, let's go over to the preferences, which on a Mac is up here in this corner and I believe on Windows it's a little bit different. I think it's under the edit tab. So the first thing to check is the driver type, which on Mac will default to core audio, which is absolutely perfect for this kind of thing. I believe on Windows you do you need to change it to a different type of driver. Hi, it's me from the future here. The Windows driver is a little bit of an interesting situation. Essentially what you want to look out for is whether or not you can see the ASIO driver. And if you can't, then you need to install that, which you can do by going to asio4all.org, downloading the version of the driver that's in your language, and then follow the install process. Once that's done, you'll want to select ASIO as your driver type in Ableton. If you don't see it here, then you messed up the install process. Then come down to this little button here where it says hardware setup and it'll bring up a sort of external plugin type thing for the ASIO driver. Here you can select your actual output device. So if you have separate speakers to your actual built-in speakers, then you can select them here. It's also got the buffer size slider, which I'm about to explain terribly later down the line in this video. But for changing your buffer size, here is the setting to do that. There you go. That's basically everything you need to know about the ASIO driver. Anyway, back to me. You'll want to set your input to nothing and then your audio output to whatever like speakers or anything you're actually listening on. You'll also just want to double check that your sample rate is set to 44.1 kilohertz. It'll look like this if it's correct. So the most crucial part of this process is this latency section here where you can choose your buffer size, which on a Mac is set as this like drop down menu here, but on Windows, it's more of a slider. And what the buffer size is, is it's the processing power that Ableton is giving to its audio driver to allow the actual sound to be processed. So if you have a low buffer size, then the amount of time between you pressing a launch bed button and the sound coming out will be really, really low. However, if you get that buffer size too low, it sort of starts to crackle, you know, it's not got enough time to process the audio, so it comes out feeling just a bit blech. So then you start to move your buffer size up again, but then doing that will increase lag a little bit. So you've got to find a sort of, you want it to be as low as you can really, but you want to find a middle ground of not much lag, but also not much crackle. And you kind of got to balance it either way to find what's best for you. So if it lags too much when you're actually playing or it's sort of crackling, then this is the setting that you want to change. So now's the fun part. We get to head over to the link tempo and MIDI tab where you actually get to set your launch pad up properly. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to plug my launchpad in now and it'll come up as a control surface once that's actually configured. So you'll see, there it is. So if you have a Launchpad Pro Mark 3 or Pro at this stage, it'll look something like this where you have three input ports and three output ports. But if you have any other launchpad, it should just have the one input, one output port. So just to quickly configure this for any of the Pro launchpads, you want to find whichever the first input port is and you want to make sure that the track for this port is ticked and the remote for this port is ticked. You also want to do that for the first output port for this launchpad as well, which is also ticked. And then you want to uncheck anything else. So you just want the track and remote for the first input and the first output port for your launchpad. If you have any other launchpad at this point, you'll only have the one port. So just make sure that track and remote are on for both the input and the output port for that launchpad. So just a quick thing to add to what I was saying about the ports just now. Sometimes it's not always the first port. Generally, it usually is. But there are some launchpads like the Launchpad X and the uh, Mini Mark III where sometimes it's the door port that is first and you don't want to use the door port, you want to use the MIDI port. So make sure that whatever launchpad you're checking, it'll say MIDI port, it might say port one or something like that, but make sure that it's not necessarily the first port that you want to turn on track and remote for. You definitely want to make sure it's either the first, if you can't find uh, the MIDI port, 
Um, but if you can find the MIDI port, then it is obviously the MIDI port that you want to turn on track and remote for. Anyway, yeah, just thought I'd mention that. Take it away, me in the past. And we can now close out our preferences. All right, cool. We're now at the point where Ableton is basically completely set up and we're now ready to actually test some projects out. Just a quick note, if you are going to do this on live trial, it's worth noting that every time you boot up a project, you're going to have to redo the setup process. Not the initial setup that we configured at the start, but the stuff I'm going to take you through later in the video, configuring the controller within the project, you will have to do that every time you load a project because you won't be able to save in live trial. So we're going to start with a MIDI manager version 6 project, which was the Pigstep project that I downloaded earlier. So I'm just going to unzip this file so that we get the main project folder. Let's go ahead into that. And what you'll see, you'll see a whole bunch of folders and files and all that sort of stuff. The main file you want to worry about is the .als file, and that is the actual Ableton live set. That's what the ALS stands for. So let's go ahead and double click this to open it. So once the project is opened, you'll be looking at Ableton in the arrangement view mode of Ableton. And you'll see on the right here that there are two tracks. There's the performance data and the device setup. Uh, the performance data is actually a group. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here that we don't need to worry about with setting the project up. Um, but if you make sure that you've clicked on the device setup track, then we can go ahead with the install process. So down in the bottom corner here, you'll see MIDI Manager V6, which is the plugin that we use to actually set Launchpad projects up. And the first thing to do is to choose your device. And in my case, that is a Launchpad Pro Mark III. There's a whole bunch of options here to choose from in case you have different launch pads. So if you see your launch pad in this list, it will work with this project. So I'll go ahead and click Pro Mark 3 and you'll see it'll say setting output channel, but it'll say failed first of all, because what we did earlier, we set up the Launchpad Pro so that it would work with Ableton but we now need to set it up to work with the project. And what the ports actually are, the input port is to allow you to click the buttons on the launch pad and have it send the data to Ableton. And the output port is so that Ableton can do all of its funky stuff and then send the light feedback back to the launch pad. So we're now gonna do the ports for the actual project. So on the input port, you'll wanna select your launch pad model. If you see multiple uh, ports here, then there was something wrong that you did in the uh, preferences a little while back. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the launch pad Pro Mark III. So the majority of the time, it should set your output port automatically as well, if the name of the input and output port are the same. But if it doesn't set your output port automatically, then go ahead and click that as well. The plugin will now set the port and it'll kick your launchpad into the correct mode so that you can play this project. Just quickly, if you have any sort of older launch pads, the ones that are sort of non-RGB, like Launchpad S, Mini, Classic, uh, basically pre-Launchpad Mark II, then at this stage, it won't kick it into the right mode. But if you skip to the performance modes chapter at the bottom of the screen, you'll see how to get your launchpad into the right mode. Just make sure to come back here afterwards. There we go, it's now kicked my launchpad into legacy mode. And you'll see that just by doing that, you can see that I can't remember how to play this project right. <laughs> and just like that, just by using three drop down menus, the entire project is now ready to go. So from here, you can use one of my tutorials over on the Cascobi Tutorials channel to actually learn the project. So just to run you through how the project actually works, the eight buttons on the right side of the launch pad are the page buttons, and you can change that by clicking on either one. If you click the top one, you'll be on page one. You click page two and it'll change all 64 buttons over to the next page of buttons. There might be more pages in the project, but it does tend to stick to just the regular eight. But if it goes up any higher than that, then you'll go up to eight here. Then nine will be over on this side and come down the bottom. So this will be page 15. Just as an example, in case there's ever projects with more than eight pages. So just a quick life hack. If there's any buttons that you accidentally press, like say you're, say you're mid plane and you press a button that's like a 15 second long audio sample and you just you just want it to stop like you just want to get back to playing straight away you don't have to wait for this thing to finish right with most of my projects i assign a stop button to the furthest left button on the top row so if you click this button then it will stop any long samples any long light effects so you can actually get back to playing just another quick note actually about midi manager projects if you have a project that uses multiple launch pads what you'll see actually once this is duplicated, is you'll, you'll see two separate MIDI managers at the bottom here. So those will be your two separate devices and they'll have separate titles. So one of them will say like left launchpad, one of them will be right launchpad, for example. And what you'll do is you'll set the device that you're using for both the left and the right launchpad. So say you have a launchpad X and a mini Mark III, then you can do that. 
and then just set the ports for each left and right launch pad respectively. And then you should be good to go with any project that uses multiple launch pads. It's as simple as that. Hey, it's future me here again. I completely forgot to mention the settings aspect of MIDI Manager. So with the three drop down menus, you can basically do everything you need to do in order to play it. But there's a few extra things that you can think about. Under here, we've got auto set channel and mode. So you would have seen when we were setting the ports that it auto kicked the launch pad into the correct mode and would have automatically set the output channel. You can disable that from here if you need to. And also if it doesn't kick the launch pad into the right mode, then you can turn this off and turn it back on again and it will kick the launch pad into legacy mode, user mode, whatever. We've also got color simulation mode. So if you have a newer launch pad, like an RGB launch pad, and you wanna play a project that was made by someone that used a launch pad S, what you can do is you can use your newer launch pad to emulate the color of that older launch pad. And the same goes for if a project was made with a new launch pad and you're using an old launch pad. So say we're using a launch pad S, for example, you can roughly emulate the RGB look of a launch pad pro because a launch pad S only has sort of red, orange, yellow, green, right? So you can sort of emulate what that RGB launch pad would look like. It sort of substitutes what white would have been for yellows. And it also substitutes blues for reds, just to kind of get an idea of what the project should look like. It won't look perfect, but it will look better than the default option. So under that, you'll see flicker reduction. Now, sometimes in light show data, there are points where an LED is turned off and then turned back on a different color almost instantaneously. And doing that sometimes can't be processed fast enough. So turning on flicker reduction will basically stop that from happening. It'll just go from one color to the next, but it will also extend the lengths of some notes by about 10 milliseconds or so. It's sort of noticeable sometimes, but usually it should be fine. So if your launch pad is still sort of flickering and lagging, depending on how much you've messed with the buffer size, then this is the setting you want to change. So under flicker reduction, for some launch pads, you'll see a secondary option, which for Pro Mark III says link base row. And what that does is for the Pro Mark III, there are two rows of buttons going along the bottom that are sort of half height. So if you have a project that was made for the old Pro, then what link base row will do is it will mirror the top and bottom button to sort of connect to each other, sort of acting as one button. So that in the long term, it basically looks a bit more like the old Pro did basically making the light show a little bit cleaner. Then you'll see on Pro Mark 1, we've got the mode light toggle, which turning that on, you'll see there's a tiny little light at the very bottom of the launch pad. And turning that on for some projects will allow that light to be mapped. You can only do this for one launch pad at a time. It's just a weird way that Ableton's built. But if you have a one launch pad project that uses that bottom mode light, then you can do that. And finally, the only other controller that has a secondary option is the Ableton Push 2, which has the drum pad layout toggle. And when it's on, it'll emulate the style of a launch pad. And when it's off, it'll sort of emulate the XY original layout of the Ableton Push. Also at the bottom, there's a reset button. So if you mess up your settings and you're not sure what you've done, you can click that and you'll get back to the start. Final thought, if you have a multi launch pad project here, what you're able to do, you're able to copy the settings from one MIDI manager and paste them over on another MIDI manager so you can quickly set the next one up. There you go. That is all of the settings available for MIDI manager. Hopefully that helps and yeah, back to me in the past. Cool, so with that, we're now done setting up a MIDI manager project. Now let's go and do an older style project as well. We're gonna do the same and we're gonna unzip it to the folder. Going inside, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of other folders. You might see some audio files in here as well, but you wanna look out for the .als file, which is the Ableton Live set. This is the main one. You wanna double click that and open it with Ableton Live. So with this now loaded up, you should see an audio track and a lights track. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna tell the project what device is going to send data into these tracks and how the tracks are going to send their data and where they're sending it to. So the first thing to do is come to the audio track and you'll see a little drop down menu at the very top here. You might see a sort of grayed out launch pad uh, looking type thing up here. So if we'll click that and we'll come down to where it says Pro Mark 3 or it, it might say something different for you depending on what launch pad you have. We'll click that. We'll also just wanna check that the track monitoring, which is these three buttons here, is set to auto. And this little button in the top right corner of the track that sort of looks like a music note with a circle around it, you wanna right click that and you wanna make sure the arm exclusive is unchecked and then make sure that it's on. It'll be a nice bright color if it is on. Then we want to do the same to the lights track. We want to set our input as the Launchpad Pro Mark III or whatever launchpad you have. 
You want to set the track monitoring to auto. Most of these things should already be set up. The only thing that won't be correct is this first like drop down menu here. You will have to do that every time and then make sure that record arm, which is this button is turned on. Uh, the one extra thing that we need to do is on the lights track, we actually need to tell Ableton where to send all of the light show data. And we're gonna do that by selecting the same port again. And the last thing to do, we need to set our channel, which depending on what launchpad you have will be different. I'll just put a little chart up on screen to show you what launchpad and what channel you should be setting to. So because I have a Pro Mark III, I'm gonna leave it on channel one. Now, because this is an older project, it won't have the capability to kick my launchpad into the right mode. So I'm gonna do that now by holding down the setup button in the bottom corner of Launchpad Pro. I'm gonna click the mutation button here. And then when I let go of the setup button, I will be in legacy mode and I will be now ready to go, ready to play this Launchpad project. Now getting into the right mode is a little bit tricky and it might be different depending on what Launchpad you have. So I'll do a few others just to show you an example. So for Launchpad X and Mini Mark III, it's a little bit different to the Pro Mark III, but kind of similar. You wanna get into legacy mode by holding the session button to get into the uh, settings window. You wanna click on the mute button to go into legacy mode and then just click the session button again to go out and you are now in legacy mode, ready to play the project. Anyone wanna bet you'd never think I'd show this launchpad again? <laughs> Well, you thought wrong. So for Launchpad Pro, you wanna head over to user mode, which is this one at the very right at the top row. It's a little purple one, it says user, click that. There you go, you're in the right mode. And then basically the same thing applies to Launchpad Mark II. You just click the little purple user one button and you're in the right mode for the project. So with the Launchpad Mark II, that basically applies to any of the older Launchpads sort of pre-2015. So Launchpad Mark II, Launchpad Mini, Launchpad Mini Mark II, Launchpad S, Launchpad Classic. That method works exactly the same for those. There'll be a user one button, which will get you into the right place. Hi, future me again. If you're getting any sort of like edge light issues, you see how I'm, I'm clicking this uh, this kick button here and the top row and the bottom row of this Pro Mark III aren't quite lighting up. You might get a different result if you're using a, a launch of Mark II or you know something like, say, say the edge buttons aren't looking right, okay? There's a plugin at the end of the lights track uh, called Top Lights and if you swap it between the Pro Mark II setting and the S Mini setting, then it should make a difference to how the lights are actually output to your launch pad. So I've changed that now to the Pro Mark II setting and that seems to have done the trick. So just in case you get that problem as well, that should be your answer. Now, the last thing you wanna do with an older project like this, you'll just wanna quickly check that the pages are working and you'll be able to tell if they are by clicking any of the side buttons and looking at this page switcher dial, which will be on the audio and on the lights track. If this doesn't change, then your pages aren't working and you'll need to fix that. Luckily, it's quite an easy fix. You just gotta head over to the MIDI map mode switch. MIDI, MIDI map mi, MIDI map mode switch. And now what you'll see, you'll see that there's a little sort of six slash E6 colon B6 thing that will come up on this button, which will be a little bit confusing at first, but all you have to do to actually set it to work is click this once and then press the top and bottom page buttons at the same time and then that will set your pages to work correctly. Now we'll have to do that again for the lights track because in this version of an earlier Launchpad project, the audio and the lights track don't communicate with each other, so we'll have to do this separately. So head over to the lights track, click the page switcher dial again, click the two page buttons, and you're good to go. And then go and click the MIDI map mode switch again to come out of MIDI map mode. <laughs> and let's just quickly test if the pages now work. So we'll go between the pages and you can see that when I'm clicking any of these buttons, the dial is changing on the lights track and it's also changing on the audio track, which is perfect. I have just realized I didn't actually explain what the pages were used for. So there are eight pages usually on a launch web project. And if you go to page one, for example, it will show a set group of 64 buttons and they will each trigger a sound and a light. If you switch it to page two, you'll then swap out all of those 64 samples and buttons and lights and all that, and you'll load up the next section of the project. It's kind of, it's splitting the song up into sections basically so that you can make the best use out of the 64 buttons, kind of extending it eightfold so that you have more buttons to play. That's kind of what the pages are for. I just thought I'd explain that. So in case you're wondering how to do an older style multi-launchpad project, 
then what you're looking at, this monstrosity right here, <laughs> is a dual launch for a project that I posted a little while ago. And the way that you configure an older style project like this is you will have two... Well, say you have two launch pads for this project, right? You'll have two audio tracks for each launch pad. If you have two launch pads, you'll have four lights tracks. If you have three launch pads, you'll have nine lights tracks. So it's kind of the amount of launch pads you have squared is how many lights tracks that you'll have. And the reason for that is that you need to be able to take an input from one of the launch pads and then send it to each of the other launch pads. So you need to have the input from a middle launch pad to a middle output, from a middle input to a right output, and a middle input to a left output. But if you press a button on the middle launch pad, it will need to trigger a light effect on the middle, right, and left launch pad. Say you have three launch pads, for example. But luckily this project only has two, so I'm able to sort of explain it in a bit more of a simple way. So <laughs> for your audio R, that will specifically be the audio for your right launch pad. So say you have more than one launch pad in this uh, drop down menu here, you'll need to remember which one is your left and right launch pad. You can sort of do that by unplugging one and then see which one shows up. But let's just say my Pro Mark III is my right launch pad. I'll go ahead and click that. It'll take about 15 years to actually configure it. But yeah, once it's done, then you've got your right launch pad. Then you do the same for the left launch pad. And then the audio tracks are fairly self-explanatory. Luckily, you only need to set the inputs um, and do all of the stuff that I said for the uh, for the older style projects. But then the lights tracks are not quite so self-explanatory. The naming of the lights tracks is usually lights and then R R or R L or M L or something like that. And what that will mean is it's the it's referring to the layout of the launch pads that are you know, being used here. So for my case, let's look at the RL track. That's saying that my right, well, the first character is the input launch pad, and then the last character is the output launch pad. So say I have Pro Mark 3, and then it'll be like Pro Mark 3 hash 2 will be my second Pro Mark 3. Um, so for example, I come down to the input here and say that the Pro Mark 3, the regular one, was my right launch pad. I'd pick that as the input because it's the right launch pad. And then the left launch pad, because it's lights RL, will be the output. So I'd pick my left launch pad over here and then set the channel accordingly, depending on what the output launch pad is. That was a handful to try and explain, but if I hope that makes sense. So TLDR, you need to set the inputs for your audio tracks, and then you need to set the ins and outs for the lights tracks, depending on whether it's RR or RL, right, left, left right you know middle right you know you need to do that for all of the lights tracks which is why we don't use this damn method anymore <laughs> hi future me here again for the last time the pages on a multi launch project like this are a little bit of a problem because you know how i was saying before about having to go up to the midi map mode switch and click the sort of the two side buttons like that yeah you have to do that for every single track here. You have to go into the audio track, you have to open up the instrument rack if you can't see it, you have to click the macro dial here in case you can't see the macro here, go up to the MIDI map mode switch, and then there's your first macro. You've now got to go down and do it for all of the tracks across the project that all have a page switcher dial. So that's a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Good luck with that. Anyway, there you go. That is how to set up multi launchpad projects with the older style of launchpad plugins. Well, there you go. Every single launchpad project that you've ever wanted is now set up a bull. <laughs> I just made up a word. <laughs> if I forgot anything in this video, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your feedback. You know, like the video as well, do all that stuff. You know, maybe even drop a subscribe if you think I earned it. If you do that, I'll make more videos like this one. Do some more handy tutorials in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching everyone. I really hope this helped you out and I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.